Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. I am pleased to introduce our inaugural SDSA interest group webinar speaker, Wenbo Wu, who is a tenure track scientist in the Division of Biostatistics at the Department of Population Health and the Division of Nephrology in the Department of Medicine at the New York University Grossman School of Medicine. And he will be speaking on data science powered provider profiling for equitable quality care in Alzheimer's and dementia. Once again, I would like to thank our sponsors, which are the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Center for Research on Aging, and our Cloudy Pepper Older Americans Independence Center. Charles, as our chair of our interest group, is there anything you'd like to add before Wenbo gets going? I'd just like to say thank you both for arranging this. And I do want to mention that we have a great panel of officers doing all kinds of work to get this new interest group started. In addition to Michelle, who is our program chair, showing you to University of Texas Medical Branch is our secretary, Hong Lee at University of California Davis is our treasurer. Uh, Anna Capuano at Rush University is our education officer. Teresa Kim at National Institute on Aging is our publications officer. And Sonju Lee at Columbia University is our communications officer. Expect to hear more from us. And if you are interested in joining uh, our interest group uh, and you aren't already on our mailing list, just uh, send a, just post to hosting panelists in our uh, in the chat, and we will add you to the mail list. And I'll turn it on over to Michelle and Wenbu. Okay, great. So I'm going to add the link to donate if you would like to sponsor us into the chat. If you have a question um, as Wenbo is presenting, please put that over into the Q and A, and I will turn it over to Wenbo. Welcome. Thank you, Michelle, for 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 all the introduction and and uh, inviting me for this. I'm. Very excited to give this uh, inaugural uh, talk about my work. Uh, so today I'm a, I'm, I'm I'm going to uh, discuss a few uh, projects that uh, revolve around a central sort of a central area of research that I've been like working on for the past couple years. Um, uh, it's about uh, healthcare provider profiling, but uh, with specific applications in uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. So um, so I will start with uh, uh, some uh, motivation of, of this of, of the uh, all of the studies. Um, so as you you know, uh, the number and the diversity of Alzheimer's patients in, in, uh, in the United States are uh, growing tremendously and uh, there are a lot of issues related to, uh, you know, Alzheimer's care, but uh, uh, one important uh, aspect of uh, of this, uh, you know, this field is okay. Minority patients are facing uh, increasingly uh, severe healthcare disparities. For example, uh, we we probably are all know that non-white and low-income people they face great, uh, greater barriers to care access. Uh, uh, than those, uh, you know, uh, white non-Hispanic group patients or uh, patients with uh, with uh, good income. Uh, there are also issues like implicit bias from uh, care providers like physicians uh, and surgeons, and some other things that are noted in the uh, 2021 Alzheimer's disease facts and figures are uh, cultural and language issues. Uh, those issues actually uh, impede the patient provider relationships. Um, so as, as, as a consequence, um, many uh, minority AD patients, they actually experience uh, more adverse uh, health outcomes than patients uh, in, the, in, in the major population. So for example, black patients, they tend to have a much higher proportion of uh, preventable hospital hospitalizations or hospital readmissions than those uh, white patients. And uh, they also, like minority patients, they also experience uh, like longer delays in terms of uh, Alzheimer's dementia diagnosis than non-Hispanic whites. So all of these issues uh, are sort of urgent and to prevent these issues from uh, perpetuating disparities, 
uh, it is important that we uh, it is important that uh, the performance of healthcare providers uh, be monitored or be evaluated so that we can uh, enhance uh, provide evidence based uh, accountability for you know an equitable care quality uh, in, in in this uh, in, in Alzheimer's and dementia. So uh, this actually motivates uh, the the tool or the the field. Uh, of uh, provider profiling uh, being applied in, uh, in aging and more specifically in Alzheimer's and dementia. So for, I guess for many people, they you, you probably are not very familiar with this. So uh, I wanna give you a quick uh, introduction of what, what, what it is. Uh, so it's a comparative assessment or evaluation of the performance of different types of healthcare providers in terms of uh, uh, you know, standardize the quality metrics uh, using patient reported outcomes. Uh, there are different types of uh, people involved in this uh, in this process. For example, we have uh, policymakers, we have payers like insurance companies, we have different types of providers, and we of course have patients and their caregivers. Uh, for providers, we have many different types. Uh, the most common type is, of course, hospital, but we also have, say, nursing homes, uh, SNFs, or you know, and 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 kidney and uh, nephrology field. We have kidney dialysis facilities. We have, uh, you know, organ transplantation centers and uh, many other different types of providers. And uh, for outcomes, a lot of different types of outcomes can be used to do provider profiling. For example, emergency department visits or hospital uh, readmissions or death or uh, even, even hospitalization itself. Um, people often do risk adjustment to account for uh, account for the heterogeneity in, in patient mix um, and standardized the metrics are often developed uh, and used to, uh, to either rank or profile the, the performance of providers. And uh, there, there could be serious consequences uh, after profiling providers because those, um, for example, those uh, providers with very bad performance, they could uh, have, they could be penalized, or they could be even decertified from operation. So it's, it's a very, uh, there could be very serious. Um, here I give you uh, one example. Uh, it's a, it's a recent paper. Uh, JAMA paper, um, they they were trying to evaluate, I think, uh, about 3,000 or even three three um, more than 3,000 hospitals across the nation, and they developed a concept uh, called equitable readmission. So they basically use two criteria. One is if you um, look at panel A uh, on the on the y-axis, you uh, you can see risk of standard risk of standardized readmission rate of dual eligible patients. Uh, so this is, uh, this criterion is to make sure that uh, for, for say, for all hospitals, they are supposed to have relatively low rate of remissions. And the second criterion is, okay, because we want to evaluate the equity in remissions, so uh, we divide the patient cohort into uh, two two groups. One is uh, at risk, the other is not at risk. So in this case, the at risk group is uh, about patients with dual eligibility in Medicare and Medicaid. So they are considered right like uh, to have like a relatively low income uh, compared to those uh, who are not eligible, who are not dual dually eligible. Um, so, uh, so this bottom left uh, part of this plot. So here we, we can see it's it's about I think only seventeen percent of all hospitals across the nation. So it's it's only a small portion of uh, of hospitals. They have uh, what they define equitable readmission, and on the y, uh, on, on the other panel we we use they use a different uh, I think. Uh, they use a different factor, so they compare black patients versus non-black uh, versus white black uh, white patients. So it's a it's a different uh, it's a, a different setup, but uh, same similar similar uh, results. 
it's also uh, we can see also a very small portion of hospitals uh, achieve equity in readmission. So this is sort of a very good example uh, in terms of equity. And this is a uh, a study that I I, I have been uh, leading. Uh, so we wanted to evaluate organ organ procurement organizations across the nation. There are uh, currently 58 or 57. Um, so uh, previously, people often uh, look at the overall performance of all these uh, 58 OPOs in terms of uh, organ transplantation rate or organ donation rates. Um, so, uh, but if you look at the three panels, if we only focus on a single OPO, say OPO 30, uh, the 30 is a, an anonymized ID. So if you only look at this OPO, then uh, if we focus on white patients, then uh, the, the, the confidence interval here is actually greater than the national rate. Uh, but if you look at the second and third panels, uh, the confidence interval actually falls below uh, their respective uh, national organ transplantation rate. So there is definitely uh, racial ethnic disparities here, but uh, if you only focus on the white patients or the overall performance, the overall performance tend to be very close to what we see here in, in panel A. So, um, uh, so this is sort of to give you a uh, idea of uh, why we should do provider profiling. So there, there are many uh, important aspects of this. Uh, so uh, doing this, uh, we can certainly help um, improve the care quality. And uh, another important reason of doing this is uh, people want to promote cost-effective care because uh, especially those very uh, like old original uh, profiling programs those were launched basically to uh, reduce uh, uh, reduced uh, care costs. Uh, so they, they certainly people want to use this tool to promote uh, cost effective care. And also because uh, providers are penalized, uh, could be penalized in this process. So that also promote uh, evidence based accountability. And uh, of course, care equity as as we seen uh, as we we saw previously. So, uh, for for example, in uh, for patients with Alzheimer's, uh, you know, they they suffer. They they could be uh, they could be adversely affected by uh, by implicit bias from physicians or other types of healthcare providers. And care coordination is also part of the uh, is something that. Uh, provider profiling can help. For example, patients living in nursing homes, uh, they, they they could be readmitted to hospitals. So it's important that uh, hospitals and nursing homes, they coordinate, uh, they coordinate uh, need, uh, so that, you know, uh, some, some preventable adverse uh, events like uh, hospital readmissions could be uh, reduced um, and, and the last one is, of course, uh, the information uh, generated through this throughout this process uh, would be very useful for patients and their caregivers to make uh, care-seeking decisions. Um, so, a, a lot of good reasons to to use profiling, uh, provider profiling as a tool. Uh, so, here is a list of some prominent profiling programs in the nation. So the first one is a state level program uh, and it, it was developed by the New York State Department of Health. They have been using, they have been looking at the uh, performance of hospital and surgeons doing cabbage and the PCI um, for the past over, I think, 30 or 40 years. Uh, and this is one of the, I think the first, one of the first uh, profiling programs in the nation. Uh, we also have the uh, hospital acquired condition reduction program and hospital remissions reduction program. These two are all uh, CMS program centers for Medicare and Medicaid services programs. So they were they were established uh, by the uh, I think by two important uh, acts. One is the Social Security Act. The other is the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the last one is one of the first 
uh, pay for performance program, also from CMS. Uh, this one uh, focuses on uh, evaluating kidney dialysis facilities across the nation. There are currently uh, over 7,000 uh, facilities um, uh, treating patients with kidney, uh, kidney failure. So uh, this one is actually a website. Uh, it's a CMS website. It's called Medicare Care Compare. So this is designed specifically for patients to uh, to search for inf useful information uh, in, in in order to help them make uh, you know sensible uh, care seeking decisions. So as you can see, a lot of different types of providers are listed here, like physicians, hospitals, nursing homes, um, hospice, uh, long term care hospitals, uh, dialysis facilities, many different types of providers. So it's you know this is uh, certainly very important for patients. Um, so um, in terms of research, uh, there are a lot of papers in this field. Uh, here I give you four, uh, four I think important papers. They, I think they all come from the uh, a, a very important program, the uh, Hospital Remission Reduction Program, uh, like two papers published on the New, New England Journal and two on the Annals. Um, we also have physician profiling in addition to hospital profiling. So here I give you two papers. Uh, one, uh, one was focused on evaluating physicians in, in Florida and Oregon. The other one as a general study, but they both uh, focused on evaluating the performance of physicians. Um, so actually the publisher of, uh, of the New England Journal, Massachusetts Medical Society, the even published a guideline, uh, including a lot of principles uh, for evaluating physicians' performance. So this one is uh, certainly an important uh, important report in this field. So, um, so as as you can sort of tell, um, profiling has been very uh, has been widely used in like many fields of many subfields of care, not only restricted to patients, say with uh, Alzheimer's and dementia, but al also uh, for other conditions like uh, uh, cardiovascular disease and also with uh, uh, for patients with kidney failure and, and other you know, different types of conditions. So, um, so it, uh, uh, as you can see, the, the importance of this uh, process actually uh, justifies using principled and rigorous methods, data science methods, to, uh, to provide a important and evidence-based uh, uh, practice. I think this is, uh, uh, and, and a lot of people are actually promoting using uh, statistics and data science to uh, improve the methodologies of provider profiling. So here I give you two uh, examples. One is an annals paper, but uh, they, uh, they were trying to uh, promote the, uh, they were trying to uh, uh, promote the idea of using better improved statistical approach to address provider profiling. And the second one I, I believe is uh, even more important is one of the, I think first, uh, well, it, it's not a published article, but it was uh, actually drafted by a, a specialized com uh, uh, committee. Uh, it's a COPS and the CMS uh, white paper committee. And uh, I think uh, a, a few like uh, big names in the in our field uh, are uh, were actually involved in this project, like uh, Thomas Lewis and Sharon Lee's Norman and uh, Stephen Feinberg and, and, and a few other people. So this one was one of the first, uh, well, uh, uh, papers uh, about uh, statistical issues in, in this field. Um, so uh, this is a, like a quick summary of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of the literature. Uh, I it's, it's uh, very, I think it's heavily statistical. Uh, many many models, many papers are are developed are, are written by statisticians. Um, so the one of the first models they, uh, that that have been used in this field are hierarchical random effects models. You know, people 
Well, simply speaking, people use uh, random effects in, in the models to indicate providers and uh, uh, they run hierarchical models uh, to, uh, to generate uh, results and uh, evaluate providers. And uh, different from that, people also develop fixed effects models, uh, which is different. And uh, there are pros and cons regarding these two main streams of uh, approaches. Um, in, in the literature, you can also find papers uh, considering uh, different types of outcomes. For example, survival outcomes, time to event outcomes, like competing risks, semi-competing risks, and uh, recurrent events. Uh, there is one, uh, th this one paper published on JASA. They they also consider random effects models, but within a, like a semi-competing risks uh, context. Uh, so the last one is uh, is a group of is a bunch of papers uh, re re using uh, causal inference ideas and, and even clustering ideas to uh, to evaluate healthcare providers. Uh, there are there there are a few, and uh, uh, this one is uh, I think one of uh, uh, one of a representative paper. Um, so um, I. I I uh, I want to discuss a few limitations in terms of the like the current methods uh, in in the literature. The first one is um, so out of the uh, a lot of these models they assume that uh, they assume linear risk linear uh, effects of risk factors, which could be very restrictive in in practice actually. So if you look at this figure. Uh, this one was uh, is, is some is, is something I draw from my own research. Uh, we wanted to look at uh, the effect of COVID nineteen on thirty day unplanned hospital admissions uh, for patients uh, with kidney failure. We have data in twenty I think first to ten months of twenty twenty, and uh, we specifically look at the hazard ratio of COVID nineteen. It's, it's like an indicator. Uh, whether the patient had a COVID-19 diagnosis during hospitalization or not. So it's a binary one. So we can we can plot the hazard ratio. And uh, as you can see here, it's uh, the, the, the hazard ratio varies uh, across uh, actually two dimensions of time. One is days since discharge. We have uh, like a 30-day window after discharge. And uh, the, the hazard ratio also varies across date of discharge it's like between april 1st till uh mid-october of 2020 so uh, given this uh you know variation it's certainly uh unreasonable or it's unrealistic to assume that you know and the model for COVID 19 to have a you know, constant effect across you know over time so uh we we definitely need something more flexible to uh to uh, to account for the uh, the dynamics of, of this effect. So this is the first uh, limitation. The second one is uh, people tend to overemphasize uh, the overall performance uh, because of a, uh, it's a historical reason because I, I mentioned early, a lot of the programs, uh, especially early programs and profiling, uh, they, they, they wanted to use those programs to uh, sort of reduce the costs, medical expenditures uh, and, and, uh, from, from hospitals and uh, for, for different types of uh, uh, outcomes, especially remissions. So people tend to focus more on the overall performance of each provider rather than uh, looking at the you know, uh, population or patient group specific performance. So this is the same figure I showed early. Uh, so uh, this is uh, also a, a very important limitation in, in the current literature. So the next one is um, well, actually we can we 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 mentioned that the uh, the random effects model and the fixed effects model have been used uh, widely in this field, but um, they actually use uh, different benchmarks, performance benchmarks in their framework. Uh, mean provider effects and the median provider effects have been used in these two uh, models. And uh, if you look at the literature, especially the most recent causal inference uh, like frameworks, 
uh, there, there are uh, there are more examples uh, for uh, there are more examples using you know either a single provider or some providers within a certain geographic region as a benchmark or you know people can also treat the whole thing uh, all of the providers the people can group uh, all providers together as sort of a, a benchmark so uh, as you can sort of tell there are many different ways of doing this but uh, there is not a single a uh, unifying framework to sort of generalize uh, a general gen general framework to uh, encapsulate everything here uh, together into a, a single uh, framework, a generalized framework. So uh, this is also a, uh, a limitation in my opinion. Uh, the next one is, um, well, uh, people often use administrative claims to do profiling, but uh, I think people all know there there are many limitations in uh, administrative claims, uh, especially in terms of uh, you know there are many uh, many different uh, you know non clinical factors. Those factors are not typically collected in claims data. So uh, in the, in contrast, um, EHR data, electronic health records, uh, they include more information about say uh, community or neighborhood level factors, or even individual level factors, say social determinants of health, caregiving information. Uh, so, so the issue is, well, in, in the literature, uh, risk adjustment is certainly not complete. And uh, there, there are ways to uh, address this issue. Um, so uh, we, we will discuss uh, briefly about how to address this limitation. Uh, the last one, uh, this is sort of a uh, uh, something uh, uh, that uh, people with the causal inference background are more familiar with. So, and um, if you consider profiling as a causal inference problem, then uh, because you know many causal frameworks, they uh, tend to assume that uh, assume this positivity assumption, basically, uh, and in this profiling context, it's it's like you know a patient. Uh, has a uh, non-zero chance of seeing any provider under evaluation. In practice, this is um, actually not quite true. Uh, because for example, you know, I give you two examples. Say I live in New York and it's, uh, for me, I, I, of course, I won't go to say Baltimore to see a doctor there uh, simply because my insurance won't allow me. Uh, and another example is, okay, um, I think New Jersey is known for uh, is known to have many like a few uh, Pacific Islanders. So a typical hospital in New Jersey would be, you know, it, it was very unlikely for for the hospital in New Jersey to treat patients uh, with a Pacific uh, from the Pacific Islands. So uh, these are uh, like examples uh, of of violations of the positivity assumption. So how to do uh, uh, provider profiling under positivity violation is also a you know good and uh, important problem issue uh, in this field. Um, so so this is this is uh, sort of to give you a summary of uh, uh, like a things that uh, we can use we can draw on from uh, like it's a it's a it's a summary of things that we can draw from the data science toolkit to uh, uh, to help to advance uh, provider profiling methodology. So uh, we want to we we will discuss like how to use deep learning or neural networks to address the first limitation. Basically, how we can relax the linearity assumption, and we want to introduce uh, a, a new framework with what we call verse, versatile. Uh, provider profiling framework that is uh, based on a new uh, probability framework. Uh, we want we can use that to uh, to address uh, limitations two and three. And we I, I also want to discuss the uh, NLP nat natural language processing. Uh, so we, we we can use that to address limitation four. And the last one we uh, we I want to discuss a. Um, it's actually a new ongoing project. Uh, we we want to use that to address the the last limitation, positivity uh, violation. 
So uh, regarding the first one, uh, flexible, we want to introduce some flexibility in the model. So we, we wanted to consider a uh, relatively flexible framework. Uh, it, it's a, a, we start with a generalized, a partially linear model. So it's a mean model, Y is the outcome, and we have um, Z being a, a list, a, a, a vector of covariates, and we have F being uh, the indicator of uh, providers. Um, so here, this um, uh, this is actually a vector of indicators. So basically, for this, for example, here, so f equal to equal to one indicates okay if uh, we have if the patient is uh, is from provider one, then this indicator is equal to one, so on and so forth. So. Uh, so this is uh, basically the mean model we wanted to use. It's a very, I think, flexible model. So we have this um, uh, function being known, but it's uh, possibly un nonlinear. And within this uh, H, we have this term. It's a like a, a partially linear combination of things. This one is a linear combination of provider effect, gamma. And the second term is a... Uh, is an unknown nuisance function we need to estimate, but it could be high dimensional, could be very complex, but it's not something of interest. Um, so this is the mean model we assumed. So the goal is to uh, to estimate uh, this term gamma. Gamma indicates a uh, provider effect, and uh, of course we have to estimate this whole part, this uh, G star function. But uh, this one is uh, of less interest because our focus is on the provider's performance. Um, so we wanted to use a neural network, uh, a simple feed forward neural network to represent this G star. So this gives you a sort of a, like a recursive uh, formula. Um, so we have the W and the B here. Uh, w is the uh, weight matrix and B is the sort of the bias uh, vector. So this is a, like a, a a figure of the of, of the feed forward neural network. So the output is actually a um, is a scalar. So here it's a it's a scalar. So this is also a scalar. Um, so one thing one issue with this uh, model is um, because here we get we're considering a uh, neural network. Uh, in practice, people often do early stopping or you know, uh, or another technique called dropout to fit the model because we wanna uh, we wanna mitigate uh, or, or reduce overfitting. Uh, but uh, this process, this uh, you know, early stopping process would uh, would introduce substantial bias in the estimation of of the provider effects, and this is actually a known. Uh, conclusion in the literature. Uh, this I, I actually cited a paper by uh, Viktor um, uh it, It's a it's a highly cited paper. Uh, so to address this issue, we have to introduce something called name and orthogonality. Uh, not sure whether uh, we have people here familiar with double D bias machine learning, but this is something that uh, used uh, commonly used in that literature. So. Uh, we have to, uh, so if we wanted to use, uh, you know, score functions derived from this uh, mean model only, then the resulting score functions could be, uh, could be biased, uh, could generate biased uh, esti estimators. Uh, the reason is that um, the score function may not be Neyman orthogonal. So, so simply speaking, this name and orthogonal orthogonality is to uh, make sure that the score score functions they are locally insensitive to any uh, disturbance or deviation of the of, of a nuisance part uh, away from the true value. So, for example, here let's say if we do not estimate this part very accurately, so if we have name and orthogonality, then that uh, inaccuracy will not, well, locally, locally 
uh, will not uh, affect the, the estimation of this uh, part uh, provider effects too much. Uh, so the, the bias could be uh, safely ignored and if we have uh, name and orthogonality. So, um, so, the question, so the next question is how we can construct name and orthogonal score functions given this uh, you know, mean model, uh, model one. Uh, so um, to proceed, we need actually need another model on top of model one. So the second model is uh, actually given the outcome and the, and, the, and the set of covariates, we wanted to uh, model the assignment of providers using another, uh, because here B is another like a nuisance function or a map, could be high dimensional. So we wanted to specify this model. And uh, here we have to introduce a second neural network here. So this is the uh, you know assignment model. So we have the mean outcome model and we have the assignment model. So combining these two, we can uh, develop name and orthogonal score functions. So uh, because we, we have been largely focused on binary outcomes like 30-day hospital readmissions. So here is an example, uh, you know, name an orthogonal score function specification. So here we have uh, a lot of things being uh, nuisance, like uh, we have two uh, neural networks. Uh, one is G, one is D. And we also have to introduce another term here, VZ. So these are all, uh, these are all nuisance parameters, possibly high dimensional. Uh, so to um, to proceed, basically we have to consider a uh, cross-fitting algorithm. Here I give you a sketch of the algorithm. So first we have to uh, partition the whatever sample we have into you know k-folds, and uh, for each fold k, um, we can fit the two models, the two neural network, uh, neural nets um, to the holdout, holdout data. And uh, we can get the, uh, uh, get the nuisance estimates using the, you know, uh, fr from, the, from the two models. And uh, then we plug in these nuisance parameters and uh, we want to solve this, uh, uh, this estimating equation, basically here we use the uh, name and orthogonal uh, scores, uh, score functions in this estimating equation. So uh, once we, uh, we basically wanna solve, uh, we wanna get the solution uh, here, like the gamma tilde. So using a cert, you know, using any like root finding algorithm will give us this, uh, the, the estimate, the estimator uh, gamma, Tilda, and this is actually the uh, uh, sort of the de-biased estimator of provider effects. So um, uh, we 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 did some preliminary analysis. I, I mean, this is so ongoing. So we 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 had some uh, very uh, I think preliminary results. So again, this is uh, sort of the uh, the data we have, and uh, if you compare COVID group with non-COVID group, we have a very uh, uh, the difference between the, the two groups uh, in terms of the effects uh, is, is very is changing uh, chron chronically. Uh, this actually the motivation uh, we we wanted to we wanted to use the uh, neural network models to uh, allow the flexibility of nonlinearity. Uh, we have some uh, findings preliminary findings. Uh, so this is uh, called a uh, funnel plot. Uh, so we have the uh, those uh, red dots uh, up here, and we have the blue dots down here. So uh, we use the standardized readmission ratio as the uh, standardized quality metric. So the higher, the worse the performance. Um, so those, you know, the, these are blue uh, blue colored uh, providers. These are, you know, good performers. And those in red are bad performers. So in total, actually, we identified about, I think, over twenty-one percent of uh, uh, of outlying performers, which is uh, quite a large proportion. So um, there, there is an issue called, um, you know, a measure confounding 
here. So we uh, also considered a, uh, a another approach to a, to a, uh, attenuate this uh, this uh, issue. So it's uh, called uh, empirical null, and, uh, uh, or more specifically, in the visualized empirical null approach. So after this adjustment, you can sort of see that uh, the proportion of um, outline providers is uh, lower, much lower. It's uh, it's about seven percent now. Um, so all right, um, now we we want to I want to introduce the second. Uh, Another project that uh, we, we're trying, we developed, uh, trying to address the second and third limitation, which are, uh, um, uh, you know, the uh, overemphasis on uh, the overall performance rather than the, you know, uh, population specific performance, and also there is you know, there is a lack of a general unifying framework to accommodate all different uh, scenarios and contexts. So this is what we have uh, considered. Um, so, uh, this is like a, a new framework. We wanted to make this new framework very flexible and uh, could be adaptable to many different contexts and object uh, objectives. Uh, there, there are a few assumptions we make, which are relatively mild, reasonable assumptions. First one is a uh, patient chooses their provider based on, of course, based on their characteristics, including, say, insurance type or uh, social factors or whatever other characteristics. Uh, the second one is uh, the outcome of a patient uh, depends on their uh, their certain conditions and also depends on the care received from the provider they, they chose. Um, so uh, the this bullet point in gray sort of gives you some some uh, like a rigorous flavor of these two assumptions, but uh, uh, if uh, you're not interested, you can simply focus on the the the, the top part. Um, so uh, this is an important idea we introduced. We want to introduce reclassification. Basically, we want to reclassify patients from existing providers to a new hypothetical one, so that we use the new one as a performance benchmark. So we, here we introduce a uh, random indicator. It's a zero one variable. Uh, so this one, uh, if uh, this R is equal to zero, then the subject or the patient is reclassified from the original provider to the new hypothetical provider. If R is equal to one, then uh, the, the patient remains in their original provider. So this R indicator actually manipulates a patient's provider membership. Uh, so uh, with this, uh, we we have additional two assumptions regarding this indicator, actually. So the first one is something about positivity. So simply speaking, it's like uh, not all patients from a certain provider should be reclassified into the new provider or not all, and also not all patients should stay within their original providers. So So basically we have, you know, well, mathematically we have these two. Uh, conditions. Um, the next assumption is um, for those patients reclassified into the new hypothetical provider, uh, their uh, provider memberships are, are kept uh, confidential or blinded. Um, this is uh, this is an interesting uh, could be this is an interesting and useful assumption in practice, but it is not always necessary. And uh, using this assumption. Uh, uh, regulators can, um, you know, uh, can provide, can protect the process from unwarranted interference from certain very powerful stakeholders. Uh, so um, we we wanted to assume this assumption in, in this uh, uh, in this framework. Um, so next, um, so. so Using this reclassification give us a lot of good uh, like uh, advantages, but uh, actually it introduces uh, biases. Uh, so um, uh, to address uh, to address this, we have to uh, use uh, certain techniques to address this. Uh, so this this blue term basically shows you the bias. Uh, so this is the original like uh, the distribution and the 
after reclassification, you know, this is the uh, the, the distribution after reclassification, and there is a uh, you know this this term in blue. This is sort of uh, the 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 bias. Um, so this actually gives us a uh, design based framework, and uh, uh, this framework actually help us uh, better engage regulators in this uh, sort of uh, uh, healthcare provider profiling process uh, because uh, regulators are allowed to lead the development of the reclassification scheme and uh, they can design what, uh, many different types of uh, performance benchmarks using this reclassification uh, approach. So um, there are a few examples here uh, this one is uh, like a very simple one. Uh, so this reclassifier is independent of the outcome and also the provider indicator and uh, given the uh, given the covariates. And uh, you know people can simply draw uh, patients from dif from different patient cohorts uh, with regardless of their provider identities. And the second one is okay. We can reclassify patients from, uh, uh, you know, from a certain, uh, from certain providers, regardless of their, you know, regardless of their provider volumes. Uh, this means that, you know, it doesn't matter whether a provider is large or small, we can use the same, uh, we, we can use the same probability to draw patients from those providers. Um, and another example is, okay, we can, we can maybe draw uh, patients from a certain provider, and that certain provider has to be representative in a certain sense, uh, in a certain way. Uh, and the the next example is uh, we can intentionally draw patients from uh, from providers uh, whose uh, minority patients have better outcomes, so that we can possibly raise the bar in terms of the performance for providers. So this is also an interesting and interesting example, and uh, uh, there there are some technical details here, but uh, I'm trying to give you the simple idea here. Um, so moving forward uh, to address the next limitation and complete risk adjustment, uh, we we wanted to use natural language processing to extract information from uh, EHR data. So. This table one sort of gives you a summary of things that are in uh, in EHRs, but some are not in claims data. Um, so in the, in the literature, actually, there are many uh, many papers uh, talking about um, you know how to use NLP to extract information from EHRs. Uh, there are different types of approaches: rule based, uh, some conventional, simple machine learning tools, and uh, deep learning tools like few forward and re recurrent neural networks. Um, and also, you know, language models, transformers, BERT, and even large language models. But one interesting thing here is uh, so far, people haven't uh, used a lot of, uh, uh, you know, closed source uh, large language models to do this. Uh, there, uh, there, there are some reasons I will, I will briefly mention uh, but uh, I had I, I have done some like uh, previous work re regard related to this. Uh, basically, we used uh, NLP to extract information from EHRs for patients with Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, there there are some challenges in this field. Uh, many many studies rely heavily on rule based methods, which is actually very time consuming to do and a very labor intensive, resource uh, intensive. Um, many studies use EHRs, but um, uh, because of uh, privacy protocols, so uh, privacy reasons, uh, many, many studies use EHRs from a single organization. And uh, in terms of the more popular large language models, uh, using this is certainly resource intensive, time consuming. And people use, uh, you know, if if we want to use, it's nearly impossible to do fine tuning of of these large language models, um, and uh, for even for open source uh, large language models like uh, uh, Llama, 
developed by Meta, there are also, uh, I think, challenges. Uh, even even people want to do uh, parameter efficient fine tuning is also very, uh, I think, resource and, and intensive. Um, and also we have uh, privacy concerns. Um, so uh, this is sort of a like a plan that we outlined. Uh, we want to do few shot learning using uh, 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 open AI, well, HIPAA compliant version of open AI GPT models. Uh, we at NYU, we actually have uh, something already deployed. It's a joint uh, effort uh, by Microsoft Azure and NYU Langone Health. Uh, we wanted to extract a social determinant of health from EHRs so that we can incorporate uh, social factors in, in the risk adjustment models for provider evaluation. And uh, the, the next one is sort of gives you a like a idea about the cost of using these models is um, you, you have to, you know, if you want to do this, uh, uh, you know, if you want to process uh, thousands of nodes, thousands of thousands of nodes, and uh, you have to do this over and over again, because you cannot do it for only once. So you have to budget at least, uh, you know, maybe $50,000 uh, to do this, which is uh, like uh, costly. Um, this is like an example uh, prompt that we wanted we wanted to consider. So uh, this actually gives you an idea of how we want to proceed with uh, prompt engineering. So we have, to, you know, you have to be very specific about your like a questions. Uh, you you want the uh, you want the large language model to answer and the, in what format. Um, so uh, we have uh, we asked the you know say ChatGPT to to give us a gives their response in a JSON format, which is a commonly used format in in a, a information exchange and computer science. Um, so um, so lastly, I wanted to spend use a single slide to to uh, to give you a flavor of what I uh, what we wanted to do in terms of okay addressing the uh, positivity violations. Uh, so, um, so we we are currently working on a new uh, causal inference framework uh, together with my postdoc here at NYU. Um, so we we have a relatively uh, I think uh, intuitive uh, approach. So we developed some novel concept uh, of fairness. So basically, if we have uh, you know, in terms of, you know, if you want to look at the math, this is like, um, if we have two providers, we want to, we, if we, we, well, of course, we don't know their true, um, like a mean uh, outcome, given a certain set of uh, covariates, but uh, um, this is sort of uh, the notion of, uh, of fairness. So if we have this probability equal to one, being that, uh, uh, provider A has is more likely to have a, a higher average outcome than provider B, then this actually indicates or implies that, uh, you know, the functional A of site A is greater than site B. Uh, these, these two functions can be used as uh, quality metrics to, um, to do ranking or to do evaluation. So um, this is not a theorem. This is uh, like a desirable uh, concept, and under and using this, we can develop some theory, and uh, a lot of things are, are under development. And uh, basically, the conclusion is it's, it's it's still possible under certain weaker uh, positivity assumptions. Uh, we can we can still preserve the ranking uh, using this uh, as approach. So. Um, it's quite uh, interesting, but um, I think uh, I will stop here in case people have uh, questions. Um, so just this is just a quick summary of things uh, I've, I've talked about. And thank you. Thank you so much, Wenbo. Um, we we do have a, a question in the Q&A. Um, folks, if you have additional questions, you're welcome to type them there. So Xiaoyang Yu is asking, could you tell more details about what information captured in medical cl Medicare claims were included in the proposed model? Thank you. 
Sure. Um, let's see. So in the, in the current, uh, I think in the, in the current model, we have, um, I guess it's not about this one. So um, it's about this one, right? Uh, so we have included uh, information about uh, patients, uh, you know, social, uh, you know, demographics. And uh, because this is a, a project for patients with uh, kidney failure, so we also have uh, information about their, uh, you know, comorbidities, and also like how long have, uh, how, how long uh, they remain on dialysis, and uh, you know whether they have diabetes, whether they have hypertension, uh, and and some other information. But we we don't have a lot of I, I don't. I don't think we included um, anything like from a social, like social factors. We, I don't think we included any social factors like uh, say housing income um, and, uh, and say food access, uh, et cetera, uh, simply because we don't have access to uh, that, you know, those factors and, and, and Medicare claims and patient claims. Um, Um, I have a follow-up question for that. Um, yep. Have you have you done any work on this um, kind of profiling for SNPs using the the minimum data set, which does have um, a bit more of an expansive um, set of variables? I I haven't, but uh, that that's a very uh, um, I I would say it's a very interesting uh, uh, type of providers to evaluate, um, and uh, I I think I I was trying to. You know, you know, in in the grant proposal, I was trying to propose something related to SNFs, but uh, I, I I currently don't have a lot of expertise in this, so I would love sir, I would love to, if possible, work with you if you're interested, and and maybe we can do something, uh, to evaluate you know SNFs. That that's certainly very interesting. Uh, but currently, I only do evaluations, uh, hospital evaluations, um. I think there there is something special with uh, with uh, SNFs, um, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, okay, we have another question. Okay, Xiao Yun uh, is asking how how good is the performance of the model um, with the limited information available? So that's a that's a good point. So as you can see here, with limited information, you know. We we have um, you know we identified sort of a very high proportion of outlying providers, which is you know unfortunate uh, because of uh, limited information, and uh, that that's why we actually you know considered uh, uh, a, a, an approach a technique called uh, empirical null uh, a, approach to address this. We were trying to basically. Um, uh, mitigate the uh, impact of uh, incomplete risk adjustment here, but um, I have to acknowledge that you know this is a approach that um, you know we 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 cannot um, uh, attribute any you know it, it's, it's sort of a a pulled uh, approach. It's it's not like we can we are able to identify with sources information. As uh, as missing here, and uh, uh, but you know this is a, this is a good approach to use, um, and of course we we need more uh, information as, as I discuss, and and regarding the uh, the fourth limitation and complete risk adjustment, if we have more information, say from I think from EHRs we we could have more information, and uh, that could uh, potentially um, address this problem, but maybe not fully address this problem. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Wenbo. Um, wrap, this wraps up our inaugural webinar. We're pleased to announce that on October 29th, we have Yates Coley um, presenting, and that'll be at 2 p.m. Eastern. I will be sending out some, publi some pu publicity on that. Say that three times fast. Um, so thank you so much for attending, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Winbo. And you. hope to see you all next month. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.